Hello and welcome to PM Express and today we are looking at the conduct of members of parliament in and out of the house. We'll also look at parliament as an institution and probably touch a little bit on the uh, constitution to find out if it's still alive or if it's dead, does it need a little bit of tweaking and how do we go forward? So it's all things parliament today. But I'm sure you all heard about the brouhaha that went on between Kennedy and Japan, uh, honorable member of Asin Central and Anas, um, Ari Miao Anas, when number 12, the video came out. Now, in all some of the tantrums that uh, the honorable member of parliament was throwing, he may have uttered certain words against parliament. So he's been hauled to the uh, Privileges Committee of Parliament. And as far as I'm concerned, it's probably the first uh, within this republic is the first parliamentarian to be hauled before the Privileges Committee. I don't know if there's some that we aren't aware of. Uh, I know Black Rasta went, but he was not a parliamentarian, and a few others. So it's uh, something that's going down in the history book. We want to find out you know, what's happening there, what will happen, and indeed, how should an MP conduct himself if he's no more... Uh, if he's not in the house, is he free to talk any at will or he should still mind and gag his words because he's a person and may be offended at any given time and could you know, have to defend himself. So what are the rules and what are the laws saying? Then we look at Parliament. How best would it suit Nation Ghana? Parliament. How best would Parliament suit Nation Ghana? Because uh, we seem to see parliamentarians are just somebody who has a fat wireless, so anytime you see him, well, my school fees, my eldering, my funeral, and that sort of thing. It's very rare to meet a parliamentarian and say, hey, you know, there's a law. Uh, you know, what are you going to do about this law? What are you doing about this law? I, 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 I haven't heard, you know, a parliamentarian in a, you know, a rural setting you know, comes to Dumasa and the average Dumasa man is asking the parliamentarian, look, what are you doing about a GMO law or what are you doing? You never hear that. It's, are you coming to my funeral? Are you coming to the festival? Are you doing the roads? Are you building the library? So these are the things that we're going to discuss today. But my name is Nanan Sakwa, Chief of the Little Republic of Akwango Dumasa. I know in time I say Republic, uh, Vladimir, if she does, the doctor wants to sue me, but you know, I keep on saying no to excuse me. I'm coming straight back here. We are discussing parliament, all things parliament. Don't go. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for staying conducts of MPs and with me in the house as an MP who you cannot doubt his conduct, uh, exemplary conduct. Good friend, Inisa Fuseni, Honourable Member of Parliament for Tamale Central and uh, he's also a Member of Parliamentary Legal Affairs. So he understands uh, all the legalese. Alaji, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank Look, you. Yes. In fact, you are not a, 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 a Jidam, so will not be the only one who will take issue with you. Oh, the, I, I, the president himself should be taking issue with you. Creating I don't know a you republic. Have, you have some intentions of <laughs> succeeding. And, 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 and I said it on air that thanks to you, yeah. I'm, I'm getting a quote hard road. As, yes. soon, as soon as it's come, we are, we are going for independence. <laughs> As soon, as soon as the Dumasa gets the quota route, we are getting independent. And I must say thank you very much. You're welcome, I know you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're very you're welcome. instrumental on that. No, thank so you, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. But today I bring you in here about conducts of MP, and it starts with uh, Kennedy Japan, Honorable Member of Parliament for Asimfo. So, I mean, we all know he's a firebrand. Uh, probably every parliament in the world has, you know, one firebrand in there who spices things up. You know, I remember in the UK Parliament, the current uh, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson was, you know, in there, you know, ruffling things and became a mayor and he was always in there. So you always, you know, have one who makes things excited. Probably ours is Kennedy. He may have gone too far, may have not, I don't know. But what should the conduct of an MP be? Well, thank you so very much. Uh, and this is a very important topic. Mm. Uh, somehow, probably because of our constitutional history or our history as a nation, mm. 
MPs have not been put under the spotlight for a very long time, you know, because of the military interventions that occurred in this country. Of the institutions of state that suffered most, uh, parliament was can, can stand out as the institution that supposed is suffered most. And that's why you can say that they can be a government without uh, a parliament, but they cannot be a democracy without parliament. Mm. And so uh, because of that, parliament presently is trying very hard to fashion out a code of ethics uh, that will regulate a guide give pointers to the behavior of members of parliament because they, they are part of the uh, high class of society i mean and so uh, a certain conduct is is, is is demanded of them you must hold yourself in high esteem uh, because uh, uh, you are one of the arms of government and elsewhere uh, i've had the privilege of interacting with members of parliament from europe from other african countries you find you see the aura aura surrounding the member of parliament coming into the chamber not carry himself and throwing his weight about but clearly the dignified pose that comes with member of parliament because you are elected to to preside and debate very important things of the of of, of, of your country and society and so it, it demands certain uh, appearance certain disposition certain presence uh, when you become a member of parliament. And yes, uh, you find Garolos Pers, people like uh, Kirida Japor, uh, like you mentioned Boris Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. Yes, Johnson, a person, Boris Johnson. Boris, Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. A person can be Garolos, can be talkative, can be rabid, uh, but not insulting. Mm -hmm. Because immediately a, a, pers, a, a member of parliament becomes insulting, it not only tells on the image of parliament, but affronts the dignity of parliament mm -hmm. because people begin to question the makeup of that, that member of parliament. People co co begin to question, it, co uh, question the rationale for having a parliament constituted by such people. That's why parliament, uh, and even in the constitution, uh, when you look at article 122 of the constitution, it says that uh, you should not do anything that will affront the dignity of parliament because the the sanctity and dignity of parliament is protected by the constitution that's why when you are on the way to parliament you cannot be stopped by the police if, if a policeman stops a member of parliament on the way to parliament that policeman will be in contempt of parliament you see, so you have these uh, privileges and immunities given member of parliament just because of the image, the dignity, and sanctity of parliament. So if members of parliament, by their conduct, themselves are eroding this dignity, this sanctity, this high esteem imposed and bestowed on them, the parliament itself must rise to the occasion and bring members uh, to book, mm -hmm. and get them to behave in the way demanding or expected of a member of parliament. At the Privileges Committee, I mean, uh, probably you'll be able to give me full details because it's still uh, unfolding. Uh, yeah, it's still unfolding. But I mean, w w what are the proceedings and what are some of, you know, w what's the end result that's... Well, 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 if you look at the sanctions that can, that can likely be imposed, first of all, let's get it clear that a referral to the Privileges Committee of a member of Parliament's conduct or an outsider, outsider's conduct is a quasi-judicial, I mean, criminal proceeding. So penalties can be imposed on, that, on, the, on such a member whose conduct has been referred to the Privileges Committee. Mm. Okay, so being a quasi-judicial, I mean, quasi-criminal uh, proceeding uh, you have to prove that case against the member beyond reasonable doubt. Mm. And so, yes, yeah, so when the member's con conduct becomes a subject matter of debate and report on the floor of the House, uh, if the Speaker, after listening to both sides of the House, comes to the conclusion that a prima facie case, that on the face of the complaint filed by a member on the floor of the House, 
there appear to be grounds for referring that conduct to the Appropriations Committee. Mm. Then such conduct and is referred and that member has to appear before the Appropriations Committee. And sanctions could range from a caution to uh, a removal from Parliament. Permanently? Permanently. Permanently. Uh, uh, to the best of your knowledge, has any parliamentarian been held before the privilege? No, no, no. no. I, under this republic, under this present republic, I have no known knowledge of any member of parliament uh, being held before the Privileges Committee. There have always been attempts to explain away mm -hmm. on the floor of the House mm -hmm. the alterances or the or the conduct of a member of parliament and to try to assuage whatever harm that member's conduct or utterance would have caused to the dignity of parliament. They have always been that attempt, mm -hmm. except that in the case of Kennedy Ajipon, uh, many members who spoke that they were of the firm view that a prima facie case has been made against him and that he has appeared before the committee. Oh, wow. Uh, has the committee given any dead, uh, timelines as to when they will sit? But today I was privileged, Nana, uh -huh. uh, to sit in the committee as a friend of the committee. And every member of parliament... Amicus Korea. Amicus Korea. <laughs> <laughs> Amicus Korea of the, of the no, committee. This one is not Amicus. I was not holding... I was not providing free legal services. Oh, so... so yes, yes, uh, yes, okay. yes, yes. Uh, it was not a court of law. Okay. Uh, I... Uh, parliament normally, if you are not not a member of the select a select committee or uh, 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 what we call a standing committee and you really want to take part in the proceedings of uh, that committee you can attend it as a member as a, as a friend of that committee okay and so today I was quite interested in uh, in what was going to happen in the privileges committee especially like you said this is the first time ever that a member of Parliament's conduct has been referred to the Privileges Committee. Mm. So I went there and I was admitted as a friend. I sat in. But today's proceedings was limited to the determination of whether or not the alterances of uh, Kennedy Japan had raised a case that could be said to be contemptuous for him mm -hmm. to be invited to explain why he has said those things. I see. And, and did they arrive or the fact that you have to invite him? They arrived at the fact that they, he has to come before the committee. Interesting times ahead. Interesting times ahead. Interesting times ahead. But again, like you said, again, a member of parliament should not conduct himself in such a way that his conduct could land him before the Privileges Committee. That is, is, a, is telling on the member of parliament. Hmm. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll leave that... Uh for uh, as, as, uh, as time ago on. Mm. But since we're here, we're talking about, uh, about Parliament. How to make Parliament more effective to the people? In my intro, I was saying it's very rare for parliamentarians to go to a rural setting, even majority in urban setting, <clears throat> apart from as media men, for somebody to approach and ask, look, this law, that law, what's happening to it, what's happening to it. It's more, are you coming to the funeral, the naming ceremony, where's my road, where's my library? You know, so, uh, Alaji, how are we going to get the public to know what it is they demand from Parliament? Yes, that's true. Largely, largely, constituents do not assess you on how diligent you have been in the passage of laws. They assess, they assess you based on how frequent you are in the constituency and how forthcoming you are with interventions which uh, uh, somehow uh, improves upon their uh, social standing and also their uh, economic conditions. And so uh, there appear to be a different standard that is used to measure members of parliament. But having said that, let me also hasten to add that they appear to be developing now. I've been 12 and a half years in parliament now. And I can say that they appear to be developing now a body of 
uh, organizations, pro mostly uh, civil society organizations, that are showing keen interest, keen interest in the passage of certain laws and are pestering, if I may say so, of members of parliament uh, to get those laws passed and that are actually contributing, contributing to the to enriching the provisions of clauses in bills that come before parliament. Some have even pushed a, a clear example is the right to information mm -hmm. a, a bill. In fact, it was largely pushed into parliament by civil society organizations. And so yes, people are beginning to talk about how do we further enrich uh, the laws of this country. How, uh, what is your position? What is your position on GMO, for instance? I mean, many, mm -hmm. many, many people have come to ask you. Oh, so what is your position on GMO? I do think that we need it in Ghana. What will it, what will it do to our farmers? Are you sure our farmers will be able to continue to survive? Some will come to say that why why are you opposing GMO? Uh, we don't seem to have food, and it appears to us that if you allow GMO into this country, mm -hmm. farmers will improve upon their yields, will become more prosperous, and there will be food available. Mm -hmm. So yes, people come to try to lobby the member of parliament uh, to either take a position uh, for or against a clause. So yes, I will say that. I have seen a movement towards holding members of parliament more accountable to how participatory they are in the law-making process. But yes, when you go to other parts of the world, and especially to Europe, you find members of parliament collating around issues of ideology. Even within the European parliament, you find the socialists. When they, when they sponsor an amendment to a bill, that amendment will reflect the ide ideological underpinning of their party. At the same parliament, you will see the liberals uh, support an amendment, or the Greens support an amendment that fundamentally springs from their ideolo ideological position on the, on the matter. We have not yet come to that. That was funny enough, that's what I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> funny enough, that, 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 was my, that was my question. You know, wh what is keeping us that long in getting there? Now, I say that because, uh, for instance, I know personally you were completely against, look, Etiwa Forest, nobody's going to go in there. Yes. Okay. Now, if, if somehow the party had said, listen, I'm going to give Etiwa Forest out, it, it probably, you, you know, you wouldn't have come up against the party. No, I did. I did. I, 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 yes, you are taking me to the, the whole different area. I did, and and when I say that, people think that I speak for uh, John Dramani Mahama. No. When under the NDC, they were offers from investors to mine the bauxite at Itiwa, and I resisted that, and somehow because of the governance arrangement uh, the information got to his excellency the president and he invited me he said hey, no, sir, there are investors who have come into this country he said they might want to mine the bauxite at etiwa uh, why are you not in support of that i said oh excellency etiwa serves at, as water catchment area for three important water bodies in this country and Etiwa has exotic species. In fact, Etiwa has been declared a globally significant biodiversity area. There are some exotic species in Etiwa that you can't find anywhere. And so, you know, when you do the natural accounting of the resource there, it will far exceed whatever bauxite is there. And fortunately, this resource is renewable. And can you guys imagine that we mine the bauxite at Etiwa, then we disturb the ecosystem, the biodiversity of the area, and the waters dry up? Uh, Excellency, to know how much we are going to, you, to, to uh, lose, you must envisage supplying water constantly to these communities who depend on the three water bodies till eternity. Let, 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 me, let me introduce Dr. Rashid Draman, who is the director of African Parliamentary Center. Dr. Rashid, you're welcome. 
Thank you. Very good, very good. Uh, Doc, just before you joined the show, uh, what question I was putting to, funny enough, uh, I have uh, Alhaji Inusa Fuseni, who's an honorable member of parliament for Tamale Central. He answered the question before I put it to him, but I want to put it to you. You know, there are other jurisdictions, and I take UK, for instance. Uh, many years ago, when they wanted to do a third runway, it was the Minister of Transport who led the demonstration to say, no, you're not going to have a third runway because of pollution and noise and everything. And so the Minister of Transport, who, you know, obviously uh, uh, aviation under his jurisdiction, was out there picketing with people saying, no, I'm not going to agree third runway. I mean, are we ever going to get to a stage in Africa, in Ghana, where... You know, parliamentarians, you know, one would say, look, I really don't agree to this policy and therefore I am not going for it. Because we seem to have both houses, you know, all going, all saying no or all saying yes. Yes, thank you very much, Nana, for having me. Mm. Uh, are we having a good line? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'm hearing a, a, an echo. Oh, sorry about that, but you, you are coming through very clear. Okay, I think one of the fundamental problems that we have in our parliamentary arrangement, I think is the, 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 the fusion that we have between the executive and the legislature. Um, I have heard uh, my brother there saying, Called by the president to explain uh, what was going on when he took a position on the HUA, uh, for instance. So, you know, over the years, one of the challenges that we have is the situation where, you know, we have members of parliament, apart from the fact that we are not sure uh, how much control has on them have this arrangement where mostly is sitting down waiting to um, to be called to be part of the executive. Um, I am not too sure that any member of parliament, maybe a few of them, who uh, will resist the call from his excellency the president to be part of the executive. So that is a fundamental problem to have. Uh, until this is. Oh, I'm, 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 uh, but uh, actually, I'm if you can check sure. the line for us. Hello. Yeah, your your line was sort of breaking. I was asking if production could tighten it up for us, but uh, let, let's hear you. Yes, I'm. I'm in. I don't know what's happening. The network might be the case here. Yeah, so the point I'm making is that. Okay, Doc, we're going to try and see if we can get a clearer, a clearer line uh, there. Uh, but, you know, until we get there, uh, how then do we get that full satisfaction of representation? Because each member there represents a group, you know, and you watch, uh, you know, American, you know, movies or, uh, you know, or in the news. And, uh, you know, an MP, quote unquote, who said, no, I can't vote that because if I, if I vote yes and I go back, I'm dead. Yeah. It's, forget the party. Yeah. You know, he say if I agree to this yeah. and I go back, I'm dead. So everybody keeps track on how their representative vote. Yeah, yes. Should, should we start? And you, you see it in American elections, how you vote, actually, could be the subject matter of the uh, campaign, campaign issue mm. when you finally put yourself up. As a candidate mm. in the presidential yeah, election, you voted against abortion. Oh, you vote. voted for <laughs> abortion. <laughs> or, so, yeah. And then, if you are not consistent, that also will come through your voting. And so, mm -hmm. so people are very careful where they stand on issues. Mm -hmm. But we, I sometimes I agree with uh, my brother, Doctor Rashid. Mm -hmm. it, it appears to me that in the Third Republic, we were so much in the rush to to put parliament or to allow the president to select a majority of his ministers for parliament. Yes, mm -hmm. the experience was that because Liman almost phased 
the uh, the embarrassment of having his budget not approved mm -hmm. by parliament when he had a majority members of parliament in parliament uh, the the when we're given a chance chance to uh, redo redraft a constitution for the republic of ghana we sort of tried this system of fusion uh, fusion the fu uh, fusion the uh, parliamentary system of government with the presidential it appears that we are the only nation in the world mm -hmm. that is practicing that system i always say when i go to uh, other parliamentary forums that that's our contribution to democracy <laughs> 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 but our, that has got its flip side as well mm. and he's right mm. that you command enormous power and respect if you are noticed by his excellency the president and made a minister mm. you definitely will stand not pari passo with members of parliament on your side, simplicity. Okay, mm -hmm. and so that status that you now acquire, you might want to guard that status jealously. And so you want to toe the line. It's normally very difficult to say that, no, Excellency, the position we have taken is wrong. It's normal very because mm -hmm. you might lose your position. And mm -hmm. especially, again, in our constitution, executive authority of states resides in the president. Too much. Too, too much. <clears throat> too much. And so he can just fire you without giving, you just fire you, that's all. And you will not even have, uh, uh, he will not give, give reasons, he just fires you. I mean, recently we just heard what happened with the state institutions, mm -hmm. Boston, other, Kolebu, mm -hmm. and those other places. The, the president directed that they be fired without reasons. Restructuring, that was all. And so, uh, because of that, we really are facing the problem mm. where members of parliament, although some very independent minded, are always whipped into line mm. in backing government policy. Okay, okay. And, mm -hmm. and that is the problem. That is militating against the development of parliament. When we chose or elected uh, uh, the Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Kay, mm -hmm. he somehow hinted on, on the idea that he wanted to build a parliament that would be independent of the executive to, to some extent. Mm -hmm. He showed, we've seen flashes of that in him, where he's taken position that clearly uh, is not consistent with government policy mm. okay and uh, sometimes government policy might be a bad policy uh, but he shoots uh, like the american missile he preempts <laughs> the policy by stating the position and then that that doses any attempt by government to bring mm. that into parliament so clearly uh, i think that yes so when the, we had another chance to look at the constitutional review the Constitutional Review Commission recommended that, yes, we should still give the president the power to appoint a, a, a number of ministers from parliament, but it must not be a majority of his ministers. Hmm. It is part of the mm -hmm. recommendation of the Constitutional Review. And so he take all the sensitive ones? Yes. He take no. I mean, if it's they not, look if at it's not, the flip side. Well, if it's not a majority, yeah. then he's going to take, you know, like defense and all the sensitive you know, ministerial look, positions. They didn't, they didn't classify. They just said, look, take, you, you don't take a majority. No, I'm not, I'm not saying they classify. I'm saying if you've given him uh, a number, yeah. then he's going to choose yeah, all the, the, the sensitive ones. The president decided, that, decided that, okay, I'm going to choose the sensitive ones properly. Mm -hmm. uh, because they clearly, yes, and there is some <laughs> guess that the president makes from choosing the sensitive ministers from parliament. Mm. Because they are members of parliament. So they know the nuances of parliament. Mm. They are friends of both sides. Mm. They are able to convince them that this policy is my policy. I'm driving it. So can you support me to get it through and do this? And it's not bad. I no. mean, in America, no. they no, do we that. No, yeah, 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 uh, he might decide that, oh, well, let me put the sensitive ones in the hands of MPs so that they can get my policies through. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that the Constitutional Review Committee or Commission realized and recognized that that constitutional provision 
that allowed the president to choose a majority of his ministers from parliament was somehow limiting the scope of choices mm. available to the president. And so uh, why don't we limit it? Why don't we just reduce it to just a number of ministers from parliament? Yes. Let me take uh, a quick break and then uh, we'll come back and uh, continue. And then we'll find out about uh, parliamentarians and their research assistants. What's happening to that? Because indeed, without research, they might be wasting their time. Don't go away. Well, thank you very much for staying. Seems we have a better line to Dr. Rashid Draman, as I said before, Director of African Parliamentary Centre. So they have uh, a thing or two about parliamentary uh, setting. Doc, hopefully we have a better line now. Yes, uh, I think the line is better. Ben can is, you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. But what I want to get okay. from you is what, what can we do to strengthen our parliament so that they work for us? <laughs> Uh, Nana, this, uh, this is a very big question. Mm. Um, I think going back to... First, First of, of all, the issue that we were discussing earlier, before we, I mean, the line went back. Sure. I think, I think there are three points that I wanted to make, mm -hmm. um, which have been militating against uh, the independence of our members of parliament over the years. Uh, and those three factors are... Um, the opaque nature of uh, uh, funding political activities, political party campaign, funding elections of MP. That's number one. I think number two is the constitutional arrangement that we have, which I was alluding to earlier, where uh, we have a fusion uh, between the legislature and the executive uh, to the extent that uh, a majority of MPs uh, I'm not saying all of them, but most of them, when they go to parliament, I think the end goal is to be called to be part of the executive. So that's uh, the second point. And then number three is, I mean, the integrity of uh, our members of parliament themselves. So when you have all these three factors coming together, then it produces the situation that we have, where I think uh, over the years, our parliament is slowly slipping behind uh, international best practices of parliamentary conduct and, and integrity. Uh, so that is, that is the, the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, in, in I mean, to answer your second question in terms of what is it that we can do to get our parliament working for us, uh, I think there are, there are a, number of, a number of issues here. Um, I think over the over the years, uh, and particularly in this seventh parliament, I think since uh, January 2016, we have seen so many um, scandals, uh, whether alleged or proved, and so on, bedevil uh, our parliament and our members uh, members of parliament. And I think uh, to cure this, one of the most important that we need is uh, it's a very serious implementable uh, parliamentary code of conduct uh, and I have to emphasize the implementable aspect of it mm -hmm. because uh, we don't want to have a code that uh, that cannot be implemented then it will just be simply a piece of paper and we want to see uh, the speaker of parliament leading the charge and demonstrating impartiality in the application of that code. So that what we want to have is that we want to have that code as a centerpiece of parliamentary integrity in our country. I mean, until we have that, uh, then I think we can keep talking and talking and, uh, and every day we'll keep going back. Because some of what we see uh, in terms of the conduct of our MP. Honestly, I think uh, it doesn't befit the title that, that we, we have accorded them, the title Honourable. Doc, let me ask you one last question before I let you go. And that's, I, I haven't done the survey anyway, but I am sure if I was to do a survey, a majority of Ghanaians wouldn't know that well, I'm electing this person to go and represent me in Parliament for lawmaking. 
most people think the MP is an agent of change and development agent. So with this notion, how, how do you know that we, how, how, how do we make sure we are selecting the best person to be in there to represent us in terms of passing bills and making laws? Yeah, exactly. And that, that goes back to one of the points that I made earlier. You know, until we have transparency, uh, particularly in how elections are funded and how MPs uh, are funded, we are going to have a situation where the political parties will keep pushing down our truth. Maybe people that they think are electable, but not people who really can, can deliver when they go to parliament. Uh, look, the issue of you know, the discrepancy between what citizens think uh, is the role of a member of parliament and what the member of parliament is actually supposed to be doing. Uh, I think it's, it's a global problem. Mm. Uh, a lot of surveys have been done, uh, including most recently one by the Interparliamentary Union. And across, particularly most African countries, uh, citizens believe that the member of parliament first and foremost role is to ensure that the economy of the constituency, the interest of the constituency, is, uh, is, is, is taken care of. Now, how do you take care of that? Our explanation over the years, particularly when we've had the, the occasion to interact with MPs and provide some capacity uh, discussion, has been that you can do that if you do your oversight work very well. You hold the executive to account, you follow the money, you don't let party colors blind your oversight work. So that if you follow the money and you ensure that whatever is voted for health care is available, even if it's not enough, but people know that this is done transparently. People know that uh, this is the cake that we all need to share and everybody has to get a, a little piece. Uh, then when they go to their constituency, People are not going to be chasing them uh, and telling them to become development agents that they are not supposed to be. Let Until then, I think uh, we, we, we are going to continue to have uh, challenges. Hmm. You want to add to that, uh, Alaji? <laughs> yes, oh, I, I think yes, it's true. Uh, the difficulty is actually holding even government to account. Because the excessively partisan nature of politics that we have here. Mm. And sometimes when you want to hold government to account, you can only do it through question time mm. in parliament. And if you follow up to the constituency, uh, to the various agencies that the, the, the government interacts with through its department and agencies, uh, people might interpret that to mean witch hunting. And so, it's really constrained. They say you've crossed carpet. No, you cross. They don't say you cross carpet. They say, oh, you know, he's digging to find out things about the government. He wants the government's downfall, and that's why he's doing what he's doing. But truly, if we come to the situation where members of parliament, members of the work of members of parliament, will greatly be appreciated by how far they can hold government to account to ensure that the interest of the constituents is taken up, care of, then. The constituents will be judging the member of parliament rightly because that's exactly what he's been elected to do. One, to make good laws for the country. Two, to hold government to account. Three, to ensure that their interest is served. And, and so I agree entirely with him to the extent that until we are able to, to do that, uh, we will still have people uh, knocking at our doors. Governments, governments introduce laws into parliament to back their policies. The policy, policy implement, implementation and poli policy uh, impact on the citizens must be said that is the policy will benefit the people. And so members of parliament ought to understand the policy implication of uh, uh, the uh, policies that are being introduced by the executive before you can even do a meaningful contribution. And so yes. Uh, uh, the, but to talk about funding, the political parties support members of parliament, but they don't fund members of parliament. And how is the nature of the support? They allow you to run on their platform, on their ticket. That's the support. But not fund 
your campaign. So if the if you get elected as a member of parliament for Tamil Central Constituency on the ticket of the NDC, the NDC will give you a letter to go to the Electoral Commission to file your nominations on the ticket of the NDC. That's the support. But you have to find your own funding. Find them to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Rashi. Hello? Yes, no, no, I can hear you. Oh, yes, good. I good, can hear you. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, 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 Alaji Fuseni was uh, uh, answering the issue of funding here, but what I wanted to find out from you, one more thing is, uh, you know, institutions that bring policies to Parliament, and because Parliament hasn't got the money, if they have to sit over a weekend, if they have to do a retreat, Parliament hasn't got the money. And if this institution needs this law amendment, uh, you know, amended, they will sometimes have to, you know, pay for it. Uh, what's your position on that? Should Parliament definitely find the money to, uh, you know, set all the institutions are meant to pay to get their job done for them? Well, I think, Nana, um, I have to say that the situation of our parliament has improved tremendously mm -hmm. over the last uh, year or so. Mm -hmm. um, about two weeks ago, um, my center, we had a meeting with the education committee of, of parliament. And I was pleasantly surprised when uh, the, the clerk said, you know, we can hold a meeting in one of the committee rooms uh, and I think whatever cost that there is, is, uh, is cost that will be borne by the committee and by parliament. Mm. And I was also very pleasantly surprised that they even gave us lunch, I mean, at their cost. Mm. So the point I'm making about this is that, you know, in the past, we used to say that um, when we didn't have the job 600 building, we used to say uh, there are no rooms in parliament, no meeting rooms, and so on. Uh, today, I think we have that. Recently, when there was, uh, uh, I think, some alleged scandal about one of the committees, uh, one of the things that we said, which was backed by the majority leader, was the fact that, at least today, most of the meetings that uh, um, the agencies, uh, departments, and so on want to hold with our members of parliament can be held in parliament, the committee rooms that are available uh, and, and again, I think the other thing that will be done, I know the standing orders are being revised right now. Um, we could have a situation where uh, maybe like it happens in other countries, committee business is done in the morning and parliament sits in the afternoon. So that, you know, this way uh, members of parliament can't get the chance and the opportunity to attend to some of these business uh, during the course of the week. And that takes away, you know, the issue of having to take them out um, over the weekend, some places and so on that is being paid for by, uh, by the agency that is sponsoring a bill uh, or some policy document. Once that happens, you know, you know it, it raises a lot of questions about the ethics and the integrity of, uh, of the arrangement. Maybe nobody might be doing anything wrong uh, legally, but ethically, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look right. So today I think we have, we have the opportunity, and I, I think I would call on our members of parliament and the leadership of parliament particularly to look at the, the, the current, uh, you know, arrangements that we have in terms of uh, the, the space that's available in parliament uh, in terms of maybe the kind of arrangement that can be done so that time is dedicated for committee work. Doc, let me... Members can ask. Yes. Very good, Doc. A quick one before I come to studio is, I mean, there's been a few, uh, you know, cash for seats and this, and a uh, few things that have been tacked to Parliament right from the beginning of the vetting stages till now, even though none has been proven. You've touched on it. Uh, is there, in two minutes, is there anything they can do to you know change this image or what, what what should parliament do to change their image and you know present themselves better than what we have seen i think we have to go back to the code that i was talking about and it should be a code that is implementable and the speaker must 
I think, uh, be an impartial uh, implementer of this code. And I think the, the, the second point is that, you know, we have seen a lot of these scandals. And I can tell you, Nana, you know, most of the time, the outcome of the investigations that take place, if you take your microphone and go on the street in Accra and other places, people are going to tell you we don't believe whatever is coming out of uh, some of these committees. And we have said uh, over and over that as pertains in other um, places, whenever there are issues like this, I think Parliament is served better and the interest of and the integrity of our members is served better if they allow an independent outside body to look into some of these issues. Doc, thank so you. So that, that way, yeah, I think uh, we, we can get uh, outcomes that can be trusted and outcomes that uh, people can, 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 can go with. Thank you, Doc. Because of time, I will end it here and I'll come to studio. And uh, Doc, with independent, uh, Alaji, with independent body investigating <coughs> cash for seats and this, I mean, there's just been one too many things that don't seem to augur well. W would you, would Parliament allow it? Because Parliament is a law unto itself. Well, I would find it very difficult to contradict what uh, Dr. Rashid is saying because mm -hmm. I have, on several occasions uh, in this f Parliament, this seventh Parliament, said that I would have prepared an independent uh, body to investigate uh, such scandals uh, because it's about the integrity of, our par of Parliament, about the reputation, it's about the confidence people repose in us that we are doing the right things. Somehow, because of the way we have conducted ourselves in the past, uh, people have lost some level of confidence in us, and they think that we will want to wash anything that comes before mm -hmm. Parliament, that affects Parliament. And so, uh, Parliament as a body is, is struggling to come out of this. I mean, today, uh, in the uh, Kirindia Japan uh, preliminary hearing, I mean, members of Parliament voice concern that if we don't attach a level of seriousness to this particular one, and people are going to say, ah, well, well, these people, we already mm -hmm. knew that the outcome would be this way. Mm -hmm. And so Parliament itself is worried mm -hmm. that somehow the, the confidence that people have in that institution is eroded and mm -hmm. we have to take steps to bring it back. And yes, Parliament has uh, uh, published a code of ethics uh, for members of Parliament. Uh, in today's sitting, that was the uh, code of ethics that guided this, the chairman of the Privileges Committee to arrive at the decision. Okay. And so... Uh, I agree that it must be workable and implementable mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, it can be deterrent, its sanctions must be deterrent enough because when we were passing the Code of Ethics, I also had occasion to contribute and I said that a Code of Ethics without sanctions might not produce any results and so pro now we must be looking to strengthen the sanctions and ensure that uh, members of parliament who violate the Code of Ethics are punished in such a way as to serve as a deterrent to other members of one, one minute ago, I'll change the goalpost a little bit. Okay. Uh, Parliament, if we don't arrest population growth, how are you guys going to develop the country? Is, has, has it been a matter brought to Parliament? It's, it's not been brought to Parliament, but I agree entirely with you. <laughs> and, and, and I love it because <laughs> I just came back from Belgium, and then we were talking about the exodus the, of Africans, the migration, mm. the siege that is happening in Europe, mm. that African young men are risking their lives right across away. the Mediterranean. Young men, they are the future of the, of the African continent. They are running away from Africa. And it, so, so I was contributing and said, look, the problem is not the Af young men running away. The pro problem is that we have just failed to control population. Mm. And because of population explosion, we are unable to manage the resources that we have. Mm. And until we manage the resources, we are, we are not going to be able to produce they needed employment for these people to stay in our country. So the first thing we have to do probably is to look at the population. It's uh, waiting for the day it will come to Parliament. But that was uh, Al-Haji Inis of Husseini, uh, Honorable Member of Parliament for Tamale Central, Ranking Member for Parliamentary and Legal Affairs, uh, Dr. Rashid Rahman joined us via Scarf. Uh, we always say thank you for watching. We'll be back to do this all over again. Alaji, thank you. Thank you.